So we're, I'm not going to go through this whole list. I'll just start with the preliminary considerations that you have to, you should, not you don't have to consider when you're either setting up a program, running a program, or just improving your program. So we want to look at what our objectives are. And I had mentioned this in the beginning, that we really want to set up programs that are, um, sorry, that are, uh, that protect the government's interests, because that's the, the purpose of suspension and debarment, is to protect the government's business interests. We want to make sure those programs are consistent and fair, and that we treat uh, contractors and apply the rules fairly and consistently, and that there is transparency to our process. Uh, I know that one of the biggest criticisms that we get as a federal government for the programs is that suspension and debarment seems to be a mystery to a lot of people. They're not really sure what goes on behind the veil. And I think to that end, um, we have started as a community doing much more outreach uh, and education to communities, the contracting community, the legal community, the acquisition community, so that we can demystify this process and have people understand what really goes on in the process. Um, it's also, it should be informal. Um, we, we want to be approachable as SDOs and, and, and S&D programs. It shouldn't be so litigious or so formal. I mean, we are the federal government. We do provide services to everybody, not just those who can afford lawyers, but those who can't either. And, and small businesses actually, actually overwhelmingly, I think, get suspended and debarred. And so we need to make the process understandable so that everyone um, can participate and have a fair shot when they come for the SDO. Uh, the second thing I think you need to think of, uh, you know, before you start up your program or while you're still doing your program is what the need is for an S&D program in your agency. Um, do you perform procurement or non-procurement functions? Um, do you have an investigative arm like the OIG for some of the civilian agencies or CID for uh, the DOD agencies? Because you will need a source to uh, refer cases to you and they have, uh, those offices have the power of subpoena, they have lots of other powers that we don't have that can really facilitate the uh, suspension and debarment process. Uh, another thing that uh, an agency should have, and I, and I took this out of the, uh, the proposed Suspend Act, is whether or not your agency would generate enough work to, to have 50 or more actions taken per year. I just use it as a guideline. Um, and if, you know, you need to consider that. If you don't have that, then there, there are other options. Because if you are an agency that doesn't have a lot of procurement, non-procurement programs, or you don't generate enough action, but every once in a while you might have an occasion to take an action, there is what's called the memorandum of understanding between agencies. You could have another agency that does have an active program actually uh, take the action on your behalf because remember suspension department is federal government wide so whichever agency takes the action it applies so you just need to consider um, some things you do need to actually it would be nice to have a written agreement I know I've done some for other agencies we don't have an agreement but some people do if 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 um, you're gonna do it continuously and uh, definitely you should periodically review that agreement if you have a written one um, to make sure that the referring agency actually remains actively involved in the process. Don't just hand off your case to another agency and then, you know, not keep tabs on what's going on. There should be a two-way communication. You need to also think about uh, your, the authority for you to actually set up a program. So do you have the regulations or policies or orders or directives, whatever you call them, in place establishing the program? And this is very important to actually have an order or directive in place because there are some programs that will get challenged and you'd be surprised that you'd need to pull that order out to kind of show that you do have authority to do what you're doing. Um, you should, uh, the order or the directive should really state exactly where in the agency the program will reside and um, just contain any other delegations of authority because some agencies, they say only such and such office could actually take an action or, such, or the, the, the uh, SDO must be in such and such office for an action to be taken and it can't be transferred to another division within your agency. Uh, so Fred touched on this a little bit. Decide in your agency where the program belongs. Um, some agencies have them in their general counsel's office, and that's perfectly fine. There are some pros and cons with that. The pro, one of the pros, for example, is you, you don't have to go through legal review because, as Rod said, they are the legal review. A con could be, you know, 
suspension and debarment, the, 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 the decision to take suspension and debarment is actually a business decision more than a legal one, and that might sometimes get lost if um, uh, the, the OGC office is totally focused on just the legal reasons. It might be a little bit more removed from the business um, than, say, um, a program in the contracting shop. For example, that is actually right in the, in the in the middle of the business. They understand the business. They understand the issues. They actually have more access to some of the uh, information that the uh, S and D office needs. A con with the contracting operations, of course, is a conflict of interests uh, that comes up with. Um, the SD also being a contracting official and having to then go back and review or take action um, against a contractor in which they were involved in the procurement. You really want to avoid situations like that. And then there, of course, the acquisition policy office. They're also You're also more aligned with the business, I think, is, is a con, or you actually see from the policy side of things how the business operates. Um, a con um, for that and also the contracting shop, you have to then go through legal review that actually can slow down the process. But at the same time, you have, as Fred mentioned, your second set of eyes, so that's also good. You also have to think about who your shareholders are and what their considerations are and uh, what they're going to be looking for from you. And you've all lived through Congress and your agency and all the programs, so I won't go through that, but you need to do, take those into consideration when you're thinking about your program. Uh, there's a checklist here for things to, to think about. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to point some, some of the more important ones out. Number one, secure sufficient budget to start operations and hire training personnel. I mean, that's one of the number one complaints of agencies as to why they either don't have a program or why their program is not fully up to speed or why they're taking so long to do cases or whatever the reason is, is a lack of resources. And so um, being able to secure a budget to actually hire people to do the work is very important when you're thinking about your program and thinking about how to set it up and how to staff it because if you don't have the money, can't really go further. Uh, another thing I would say is um, the case management system, which I'll touch on a little bit. I mean, I I'm going to make a disclaimer here. I I'm the GSA SDO. Sam is in charge of, I mean, GSA is in charge of running Sam. I have nothing to do with Sam, okay? So <laughs> my only role is I act as a liaison between the Interagency Suspension and Barman Committee and the GSA Sam office because we have easier access to them. But I have the same issues that you do. So to the extent that you have complaints about Sam, not here, not today. <laughs> you could voice them. If, if they're you know, legitimate complaints, definitely as a head of the ICC working group, we'll take those into account and bring them to Sam. But I do want to say that I do not run Sam and had nothing to do with how Sam works. Um, I think uh, one of the other functions, the startup I want to point out here is to really engage in outreach to explain the function of suspension debarment to both internal and external stakeholders because we find that a lot of the criticism that we get from this program stems from a real lack of understanding of what suspension debarment is and how it works and how it's supposed to function. There's this whole idea out there that suspension debarment is for the punishment of the contractor and that's not the purpose. The purpose is to uh, protect the government's business interests. So I encourage you to start getting out there and explaining uh, the purpose. And there, there are plenty of opportunities to, to go and speak on this topic because uh, we get asked all the time to go out and speak on the topic. So please uh, take advantage if you get asked, your agency gets asked to go speak, please go ahead and do so. Or if you need help doing so, then, then call one of us at the, on the ISTC or on the training subcommittee panel. We'll be happy to help you to explain your program to, um, or the S&D program to stakeholders or anybody who's interested. All right, so what are the characteristics of a sus successful suspension debarment program? Some of these I took from the 2011 GAO report. And so they outlined three essentials for a robust S&D program, and one is an active referral process. I'll get more into the definition of referral later. Fred had talked about it a little earlier. Two is dedicated full-time staff. And the third is written and detailed policies and procedures. Now, 
I've gone through just based on experience and, and other things. I think OFPP had given out a memo, I think, later in 2011 that actually um, also had some guidelines about what an agency should do to have an effective program. So I, I took two of them from there. And just from experience, I also think that establishing a case management system is, is absolutely essential and uh, establishing measurable performance standard and metrics because we keep getting asked all the time, why do you take so long to do a case or how many cases have you done, that sort of thing. And it's, you really need to establish um, a performance standard and metrics because, again, when, when we get audited by the IG, they ask us these things like, well, how long does it take to do your case? What, what is your, your time, uh, time period for doing a case? So it's good to have something established that you work with and then uh, if you're a manager in the government it's it's also something that you can use to uh to, to performance manage uh your employees you can base your actual performance plans on some of these uh, measurable uh, metrics so an active referral process and 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 fred talked about this a little bit uh, the isdc has a definition for uh, a referral and it's up there it's pretty much when you put together enough of a package to get to the SDO for decision. We in the uh, ISDC community use that word referral to mean a lot of things, but really what we're talking about most of the time is just that the whole set of information that kind of comes to the S&D program office that then eventually get transferred to the um, SDO for consideration. So. I'm going to call them recommendations, Fred called them intake memos, we're talking about the same thing. So I might slip up and say referral sometimes, but you know what I mean when I'm talking about that. So they can be either fact-based or, or court action-based, um, and uh, there's a whole bunch of things that the, those ref referrals or recommendations should include to make the package more complete and make the, the case go on. Uh, move forward at a quicker pace rather than having to go back and forth to uh, uh, get these uh, documents. So investigative reports, any, uh, ooh, all right, I am uh, about to lose power here. In my bag over there, there's like a cord, a power cord. <coughs> Thanks for it. On the brown, the brown bag on the floor, thank you. Um, any uh, relevant court documents or facts or exhibits or any other information that you think is necessary that will help uh, the SDO and the SND office uh, process the case. Um, so what are the sources of this information that, that we're saying that these packages should include? The, the Office of Inspector General office is one source of uh, such uh, referrals or information uh, for the DOD is a criminal investigative division and any investigative or auditing uh, functions that your agency has, they can all uh, provide this uh, information that would lead to an SDO taking action. Acquisition uh, officials or professionals are very important in this process. I can't emphasize that enough. I do do a training every once in a while for just acquisition workforce, and, and, I, and I try to emphasize the role of the acquisition workforce in this process. Because if a contractor is not performing, that is a cause and a basis for debarment, but the SDO is never going to hear of it unless the contracting official, the acquisition uh, person or official actually tells somebody. That, that there is a performance issue going on. So it's very important to have, and, and not just acquisition, the financial assistant official, anybody involved in the procurement process or even in the non-procurement side too, anybody involved, it's very important um, for you to feed this information up to um, your suspension barment office. Um, there are also the, the whole bunch of stuff, but media, um, hotline topics, referrals from the public, uh, obviously, with referrals from the public, you know, you do have to do your research to make sure that that is, and, and from the media too, just because something is in the Washington Post doesn't mean that is entirely true or that you have the full story. So be careful. Um, when we, uh, I'm just going to talk about this in, in, in the context of a referral from an IG's office or a CID's office that actually puts together a more um, substantive package. But there is just some minimum basic information that I think should be included in that package. 
most of it's obvious but contact names and of individuals and companies with valid addresses because that tends to be an issue sometimes and people move around and that's why it's important to actually have a great relationship with your OIG office because you might get a referral and the person probably is not in jail yet but by the time the end of the case comes and conviction comes they're in jail you you really want to keep on top of that information to make sure that you're sending the the notice or the debarment letter to the right address and you're not going back and forth all the time we do get complaints all the time because as you know as soon as the sdo signs um a notice it's effective and it goes on sam and if we have incorrect addresses we could go back and forth and once before that person actually gets noticed and and people do complain about that that they weren't notified on time so um, any general information you have about the company the duns number social security date of birth of individuals uh, the duns number is very important when it's an it's a company because it, you use that as an identifier in sam and if you either have the wrong Don's number or no, it makes it a little bit more difficult sometimes. So be careful that you do have um, that information if you can in the package, if you can before sending it up to the SND office. Um, the Nexus, this is a big deal. Uh, listen, we're not interested in suspending and debarring every criminal that there is out there. That is not our purpose. So there has to be some nexus to federal government or contracting. It doesn't even have to be federal, but it could be state or local because the definition of contractor is so broad it can include those who could possibly do business with the government in the future but you do have to have some kind of nexus to federal government contracting or otherwise um, we just we just don't have we, that's just not our purpose to debar all the murderers or thieves that are out there there, there has to be some connection to federal government um, um, same thing with the individuals. Um, employment information is very important. Some agencies have different policies on there. I know at GSA we have the policies that, that we will not suspend or debar a current government employee. Um, our thinking is that that kind of might get into the way of them doing their jobs. And if the agency hasn't seen it necessary to take an employment action, then who are we to maybe de facto fire somebody from their job? So we do not do that. However, we debar plenty of, uh, of past government employees. GSA in particular, I think we have a lot of abuse of uh, our spending cards and the gas cards that the vehicles use. And, and uh, not just GSA employees, but federal government wide, those employees uh, get debarred once they, uh, they abuse the use of, of those uh, gas cards. Uh, any connections to other respondents uh, should be explained if possible um, in the documents and to the extent that you can provide actual documentation showing the connection between companies or between individuals and companies. That makes it easier for us to make the imputation and or affiliation argument if needs be when we come to that part in the case. Um, Please always include aliases. Uh, there are so many times when people go by two, three, four different names or, or doing business as if you're a company, include those if, if those, are, um, those are available. Uh, and uh, in, in for suspension, if it's a court-based action, then at the minimum, please you know, include the criminal information or the indictment or whatever document it is that the court has issued that gives the basis for the suspension and debarment. Um, and it's fact-based, any other evidence that actually meets the adequate evidence standard that is required for suspension and debarment. Uh, it really just slows down the process if we have to go back and forth with those basic documents. So just make sure those packages include those documents. Um, Again, for debarment, if it's a court based and a signed judgment or a plea agreement accepted by the court. And uh, if sentence is available, please provide that too. And if it's fact based, any information that meets a preponderance of the evidence standard, that's necessary for debarment. So a little higher than the suspension standard. Okay. So here are some best practices that we gathered from different agencies about setting up your uh, uh, referral process. Um, I know some agencies, uh, their senior procurement executives, they issue guidance to their uh, procurement workforce to actually refer 
uh, terminations for cause and terminations for um, default of contractors to the suspension debarment office. Um, and so because those are causes for debarment, but we oftentimes just don't ever hear about those if we're not connected to, to that. So that would be one thing that an agency could do to sort of encourage referrals. Um, develop and issue guidance to the acquisition workforce to um, set to report these TFDs. A lot of times policy offices and, and our program sit in the policy office. A lot of times policy offices, they, they issue these rules and, 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 um, and sort of policy letters without really explaining properly to the contracting workforce, now how are we supposed to do this in reality? So really make sure that you, along with, you know, um, issuing a policy directing that, just to really give some practical guidelines and training as to how that should happen. Uh, establish a central intake process, Fred mentioned that before. Again, we're moving into this, we are in this age of paperless, and so um, we're encouraging that you do everything electronic. So setting up an email address to receive your information would be highly recommended. And acknowledge receipt of, of the referral or the intake. Uh, the people who are working these cases, they work hard to get you this information. So please have the courtesy of responding to them and let them know that you actually have gotten it. And then notify them of whatever final decision or determination that uh, the SDO makes. Uh, you can also, again, outreach and education, engage in fraud awareness briefings any kind of outreach you could possibly do to um, the people who are actually making the referral to you. And, um, and you know, train, uh, you can actually offer training to the auditors or the investigators and the acquisition workforce on what it is that the suspension and debarment office is looking for to actually have a case that's actionable. So I encourage you to do, engage as, as much outreach as you can to those sources that are actually feeding you the information. So that was the first uh, characteristic of a, a successful s and program, having a, a good referral process. The second one, and you, you, this won't, if you don't have this, you have nothing. So you actually have to have, the, you know, the, I say full-time staff here because that's what GAO said. And I know in different agencies, it's all over the place. Sometimes it's part-time, sometimes full-time. Some SDOs are part-time, some SDOs are full-time. Uh, whatever you have, as long as it works, just you actually just need to have something. So I'll start with the SDO. And the SDO is an independent decision maker. And it's not subject to influence by others. And um, the SDO's decision is final and cannot be appealed within the agency. Now, people can write and ask for a review or an independent review, as, as Fred has alluded to, but uh, if you do want to appeal an SDO decisions, you need to go to federal court. And the SDO's, uh, the SDO is a face of, of, of the agency's S&D program. I do want to say something about SDOs here that's probably not written here, that is, is equal as important as these things. It is not a job for the faint of heart or the weak of spine. You will be criticized, you will be challenged, you will get pushback. You have to have be at a certain level of maturity in your life to be able to figure out who you are, what you stand for, and what you believe in, because you will have to fight. I, I, always, I always say that. I, I, I've seen that when I was watching the SDO, and now that I am the SDO, I know it to be true. It is not for the faint of heart. Okay, so some, some skill sets. Uh, uh, I'd say that, okay, a business background, a legal background, acquisition, auditing, education, and experience are highly recommended. Um, some SDOs are lawyers, some are not. Uh, but uh, I do think whatever the case is or wherever your, your, your S&D office lies, it's actually good to have somebody with some legal education or experience in that office. It, it will help enormously. You really do have to make independent decisions, as I said, and then it, it, it's, it's almost a quasi-judicial function because you've got most times two parties, um, uh, you, the government and, of course, uh, 
the uh, the respondent, and uh, sometimes it's a back and forth. Sometimes um, you have to make decisions similar to what a judge would make. So uh, just that ability, and then the the role of the uh, the STO is, uh, and I, this I also got from GAO's, uh, no, I'm sorry, the OFPP's 2011 guidance, where when they instructed each agency to have a senior official that actually. Um, uh, is designated as the SDO in their their agency, but they they would like the SDO to assess the agency's program and and determine what the adequacy is for training and resources. Um, again, if you can have full time staff, that's nice. Most of us don't have that, but as long as you have some staff that's actually doing S and D work, then then that's good. I, I for example, I, I, I'm supposedly a full time SDO, but I actually do have another full time job, which is I'm also the agency protest official, and our office does a whole bunch of other things. But the fact is, we are we have I have a full staff dedicated to actually doing this work also. But we split. However, you count full time, I don't know, but it, it gets done. <laughs> um, <laughs> So internal controls, and Fred had mentioned this, and tracking capabilities, it really is important to do this. If, if you have a bunch of paper files like I had there, you know, at, uh, five, uh, five years ago, when, I, when you get asked, well, how many actions did you do? Or when the IG comes and says, well, how many actions did you do? Or how many cases do you have open? If what you have to do is go over there and try and count paper files, you're in trouble. You really do need a system that can track um, all your cases and, and manage your cases and, and and as Fred said doing it electronically is the way to go so if you're not there yet please kind of make that as a goal for 2015 is to uh, go away from paper and, and get get to paperless um, I think one of the things in the GAO report which I didn't mention as a characteristic of uh, a successful program but I think the GAO maybe as a side note I don't remember how they did it but they did say that uh, some agencies or a lot of agencies were not participating in the ISTC and so you need to this STO needs to ensure that there is active participation on the part of the agency in the ISDC and even if the SDO him or herself doesn't go to all the meetings please send somebody or designate somebody as a representative. And also, again, I think it's a, a role of the SDA to engage in outreach and education. Uh, so what about the staff? Uh, you can't do the work without a staff. And so, again, the same sort of uh, le uh, experience and background um, is recommended for your staff. does not have to be, but that's just what's recommended. A lot of this job is writing, okay? Those memos that you do, whether you call them arms or whatever memo you call them, those are all writing. And a lot of, of an S&D case is actually connecting the dots and analyzing properly to make sure that whatever the decision that SDO makes will hold up in court and actually make sense and is practical. So we look for people with writing skills. Uh, you also have to collaborate a lot with other agencies. You also have to interact a lot with outside counsel or the respondents themselves. So good communication skills, uh, negotiation skills, and collaboration skills are, are good. Intern program. So I told you when I went into that room and I saw all those files, right? Um, we said, how are we going to do this, right? And we, at the time, had somebody who was interning, a law student who was interning, and we thought, hey, let's get law students. I say law students, it could be a college student, whatever the intern is. But it is with the help of two interns over summer that we actually were able to clear, clear out that backlog. And so it, it is invaluable, the amount of work that the interns can do. Um, it's actually a good thing because most of these colleges or universities or law schools, they actually allow the students to intern so they can get practical work experience and they get credit and we get free labor. So, I mean, it's, it's a good deal. Now, the government has, uh, and it's not really free, but cause you, you actually do have to spend a lot of time training and put, you know, and give in to the intern, but it's actually worth it. Uh, I know the government has a policy. We cannot really accept free labor. I say that as a joke. It's not free labor. Uh, they're actually getting credit in turn for it, so they're getting something. So, um, so we can accept free labor, just so you know. That was just a joke before. We actually, you actually have to give something in exchange for that labor. And what 
they're getting is the experience that will then count as college credit or law school credit or whatever. But they are absolutely essential. My staff is uh, actually one of the persons here, Michael. He is a product of that program. I tend to hire people permanently, generally only those ones who have interned in my office because, again, um, you know how hard it is to performance manage a government employee, so I prefer to hire people that have come here, have been tried and true and tested. So we keep in touch with all our interns, so whenever I have an opening, we send it out to them because we want them to apply because we know what their habits are. But I would encourage you to, to, to develop a, a real formal um, intern program because it really will help you. And uh, my group has developed a, an, an onboarding process. It's pretty developed. We can sh we're free to share that with you. Just email me, send me an email asking, you know, for us to share or uh, orientation program. And it's pretty it's pretty comprehensive. So uh, it, it it actually pays off to actually put the effort into training the interns because you will get the return. Now a, a word about interns. They are not here to go do photocopying or all the administrative tasks that you don't have time to get done or want them to do. They actually, you have to report back to the school um, and, and they want to make sure it's meaningful experience and that they're supervised properly and that they're trained properly. So please do not hire interns to just do photocopies or stuff like that that nobody can get to. It really actually does have to be an experience. But I, I'm, I'm a believer in it. It has worked for me. It's, it works even more so when you're short-staffed and you're still trying to fill a vacancy that there's a, as a hole that those interns can plug in. What we've done here at GSA is to try and recruit on a career, not just interns, but in general, is to, to recruit on a career ladder system. So we tend to do like a 9 to 13 because that at least guarantees them a promotion every year up to a 13 as long as they're performing their jobs. It's, it's a good recruiting tool um, and it's a, it's, it's a good retention tool. Uh, as you know, you know, we, you know what we pay. A lot of these students are coming out with a hundred to two hundred thousand dollars worth of student loans so um, you know it's very hard to live in DC which I heard today we're the most expensive city to live in on that kind of salary uh, if your agency does and, and agrees to it offer the student loan repayment assistance program because that helps them a lot with uh, with their expenses that's also another great retention tool okay so the third characteristic of uh, uh, successful s and program is um, actually before I move on I do want to make one point about just the staffing uh, we're I am one of the newer STOs I don't know all the STOs in the federal government there are, there are a lot but I, I am familiar with most of them who are active in the ISTC I am one of the newer ones and um, if I may say so myself, I'm probably about the, young, uh, the younger or maybe the youngest SDO that's in an active program right now. And what I, what I realize is that, and I just want to reinforce this, that we really do need this community of practice. Like, you don't have to feel like you know everything or you have to have all the answers. Uh, I reckon, and I've worked in S&D before I became an SDO a year ago, and I realize there are times when I'm like, I, I need somebody else to talk to. So I have no problems with calling Rod Grandin from the Air Force or Norm from um, um, DLA or Trevor from the Army or Randy from ICE or a anybody to say, hey, here's an issue that I'm, I'm dealing with you know, can you help me think it through? And so I say the same thing to you guys out there. If you have issues that you need to, to, to think through, call us. I personally value and respect the knowledge and the wisdom and the experience that comes from somebody who's older than me and more ex experienced than me. And so I, I want to just encourage that today, that we actually reach out to each other, not just engage in these silos, because I have benefited greatly from talking to other people um, who are, are more experienced and knowledgeable than I am. So uh, let's go to the third characteristic. Uh, so the uh, written and detailed procedure. So you need to, the, the, the authority for that is in the FAR um, for the procurement stuff. I'm sorry, I don't know. I didn't think of putting for the non-procurement common rule where that is, but um, there's authority for our written detailed procedures in, in the FAR. And then there are also agency-specific regulations. Those are just some examples of, of agency-specific regulations. But uh, you need to know where those are and what your authority is, depending on what agency you're from. 
Okay. Standard operating procedures, okay, SOPs for short. And, um, and here's a purpose, to provide the uniform execution of a task, ensuring that every person who performs a task does it the same way every time it's performed, consistency. There are instructions for performing recurring activities and reacting um, expected events. So here's one of the things we learned, and we have, GSA has a very a detailed SOP. When the, the SDO left the agency in, in whatever year he left and the program fell apart, that's one of the reasons the program fell apart, uh, is we didn't have any standard operating procedures in place. So the people who came to take it over didn't really know what was what. And you never want to run a program that if somebody leaves it falls apart. There, there's a big gap in there. So this is one of the tools that will help you to actually have a program that will outlive whoever it is that's actually doing the work. And so um, the, I'll make the point that they're only useful if, if actually they're used and they're well written. So you need to, to write them. We use them to train or new employees and or new interns all the time. But uh, they need to be used or they need to be followed. And they also need to be updated occasionally. So an SOP that is five years old, that's never been updated, probably is out of date because things may have changed. Until then. I know five years ago we were all paper, now we're 100% electronic. Five years ago we didn't um, have um, a case management system, now we do. So, so you do have to, to keep updating your SOP and it should just cover some of these basic, uh, sorry, There's these basic uh, information, personnel des designations, case processing guidelines, that sort of stuff. So I'm not gonna read through all these and you'll get the slides to see the detail, but that just contains some information as to what an SOP should, can, should cover. Um, uh, you wouldn't believe it, and I, I, I used to process cases, because I said I started in 2009, but if you ask me today to actually fill out that green card and, and mail it off, I would have a hard time, because it, that whole green card certification thing is so complicated <laughs> that um, I, I just don't remember how to do it. I'd figure it out after a while. And so having something like that actually gives you a step-by-step -step case as to how to actually mail something out, certified mail return receipt of the U.S. government. So it, it covers every little thing that, as I said, if somebody walks in, they could at least read something and have some clue as to how to actually perform these cases. Um, Again, the review and approval signatures are, are important and revision history. And then, you know, we have sample documents at the end just to show the person uh, reading the document what it, should, what it should contain. All right, a case management system, okay. Um, we definitely recommend electronic. If you get nothing else from today, we need to move from paper to electronic. Uh, it really allows for workflow management, case tracking, and routing and approval and for auditing, because when you get audited, at least you can show your, your trail. Uh, it, it should have a reporting function, whatever case management system you, take. And, and, and there are a lot out there, there's, you know, pick one that works for you, it doesn't matter, some are cheaper, some are more expensive, but uh, every year you have to do the ISDC report, and so it makes it really difficult if you don't have your information stored electronically, and then you have to go count by hand how many S um, debarments you did, how many you know, meetings you had, how many administrative agreements you did, that sort of stuff. Uh, I don't know about your agency, but GSA is pretty big on telework, and, and uh, that seems to be the way that a lot of agencies or employers in general are going. So this really allows uh, em employees to remotely access cases and work from wherever they are without having to be stuck to a file. I know here at GSA we do have a policy that we do not like case files being taken out of the building. And so this really allows us to do our work from wherever without having to be stuck from a uh, file. And then make sure that that system contains an archiving function and a record destruction schedule. Because I th the record management rules say, I think you need to keep your documents for six and a half years, something along the line. Make sure that it's set up so that it automatically tracks that and destroys that when the time 
comes and that it actually archives your information because you don't want to get your information lost. Now, I, I am going to be honest with you. We do still keep an Excel spreadsheet that, <laughs> that has our cases because, you know, things fail. But at least we, we have a way of retrieving the information if we do. But um, that those are essentials of a case management system. Performance standards and metrics, right? I think the number one performance standard is timeliness. You know, we, we, um, I think we struggle with that sometimes in terms of processing for, for different reasons that are legitimate, but we need to set some performance standards for carrying out each step of the process. It'll, it'll just, it, it promotes accountability and just an efficient way of running your shop. Um, and then uh, a GSA, our, a part of our performance evaluations for my team is based on actually meeting these performance standards. So um, it's important to do so. Um, also, you're going to measure your actions, right? Because a lot of people ask us, so how many this did you do? How many that? We all know suspension and bomber is more than about numbers, but we still do have to keep track of the numbers. So, you know, track track the actions that you do and develop mechanisms that track that and can show that pretty easily. At GSA, we have um, a, 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 what do you call a scorecard that we update quarterly uh, with our actions and it's put on a, a public website that people can go and see what our actions are. And so we also track the causes for suspensions and debarments. We get, we get asked, we started getting asked those questions so frequently that we just decided to track. Most people say, well, what's, the, what's the most common reason for, um, for uh, suspending and debarment? In a GSA, when gas prices are high, those gas cards get stolen really often. So we'll get a lot of theft <laughs> type debarments because people steal the gas cards so that they can get gas for free and just so you know how that gas ring runs is that somebody the, the government has a gas card that they issue to government employees um, to fill up their vehicles and that employee sometimes the card is stolen sometimes the card is lost or some cards the card is is sold or used inappropriately and what people will do is call their friends and family and say meet me at such and such gas station and you know you'll get a whole tank of gas for like you know twenty dollars cash they pay cash and then they fill up their tank and then they, they, they keep going. Or if it's a bigger ring where it's like a, a gas farm, they'll actually have, uh, I've still seen pictures of this, where the, the, uh, they'll come up to the gas station with a truck, with a, a truck with a, with a tank in the back of it, pickup truck, and they, they steal the gas from that station and they bring it to this gas farm, farm and then they fill up like this big oil tanker of gas and go back and sell it to the same gas station that they stole the gas from. So it's quite interesting. But um, but that tends to be like a, a, a big seller GSA is, is a theft for gas card. They also, one of the reasons for tracking it, it reveals sort of certain gaps or issues that need to be addressed. Um, Obviously, the gas card issue is another one. Maybe people are not keeping their gas cards in a secure place, or maybe it's just too e easy to figure out what the numbers are. But it reveals something that might the agency can address, um, either in training or outreach education. So, um, so this is just a sample of, of you know, your metrics. So you can come up with whatever method you choose, but. Say, say this sample is showing quarter one and quarter two um, of, of a year, and then it kind of gives you all the actions taken. And so remember, a lot of people talk about suspension and debarment, and they think of those as the only tools that the government uses to protect itself. So I think Fred mentioned we have other tools, the show cause letter, you know, the request for information. Um, it actually takes just the same amount of work to do a, a no action uh, as to do to take an action. And that's a lot of work that, that's involved in doing this stuff. So it's important for your agency, for your management, for your bosses when they're asking, not to just give them the number of suspensions and debarments you do, because that does not tell the whole story. You do a whole bunch of other things to support this process that is equally important. Administrative agreements take enormous amounts of time to, to actually even draft or, or manage. Um, uh, meetings with respondents, they take enormous amounts of time to prepare for. So you really need to figure out everything that you do and, and develop a metric for tracking it. So when you're showing your performance, um, you have more than just, I did certain number of uh, suspensions or certain number of debarments. So especially in, 
important for internally for your own performance management. So to make sure that people understand that what you do is not just simply take suspension and debarment action. And actually on, make them understand that do not rely on the numbers only because there's so much work that goes into even getting one, that one number. And so it really is important to, to, to make that come across when you're talking to your senior management or people that are, you know, have an interest in knowing how your program is run and why certain things happen. So remember, again, you're going to be challenged and criticized and questioned or whatever, and you need to be able to, to show exactly what you do and why things operate the way they do. Um, this is just a sample again for just tracking your causes for uh, debarment. What's a Hobbs Act conspiracy, you might ask? But uh, uh, that one, that one is uh, that you know a corporation or an individual may not engage in in acts or that um, lead a public official to actually act corruptly, that's against the interests of the federal government. And that normally translates down into the states where if there's public corruption going on in the states, um, that a lot of that, that funding from some of those state jobs are, are federally funded, and that's sort of how we get our hook, like, you know, a, a whole county may have a whole set of, of public corruption going on because there are some construction jobs, uh, these... Uh, buildings that are federally funded that um, the way that they get charged is actually on the Hobbs Act because they actually were bribed as a public official to to um, give these entities contracts and, um, and that, that actually is pretty common in GSA because we do a lot of construction and that's a lot of bribery occurs in sort of um, the public construction arena so that's a pretty um, credit card misuse but whatever it is your causes are start tracking them and because they, they'll reveal something to you that I think will be helpful all right Sam just a brief word on Sam you know that you have to enter all of these uh, actions into Sam within five days according to the FAR three days according to the, the procure, non procurement common rule um, each employee, each case officer who handles the case is, is, is responsible for entering that information. And it really is important to enter that information correctly because that is a public face and we do get a lot of calls and I do get a lot of calls, not because I run SAM, but people think that I do because I'm the suspension department official. And so, you know, if the information is incorrect or something like that, it... it you know, it reflects negatively. And just so you know, SAM is used for multiple purposes, not just for the government. A lot of lending institutions use SAM to check their lenders or their, the real estate agent who's um, actually closing on the house or the appraiser. And they'll hold up the closing if uh, a name is on SAM. And so it's important for it to be correct because you do not want to mess with people's lives if you have something incorrect on SAM. Um, Sam's language is a little different from what we're used to in EPLS, so just make sure you consider the language and what it actually means, what does proceeding spending mean versus proceedings complete, active versus inactive. We have, we have a lot of questions about those things, um, so, but just make sure you become, uh, just be familiar with how Sam works, and um, I send a lot of people over to all of you guys when they call and say, so-and-so, I say, ah, that was HHS, oh. That was the Air Force. That was, uh, you know, I, I'm not responsible for that. Please go call their representative. And then another thing is there needs to be an agency representative on SAM because a lot of the reasons why I get these phone calls is they have no idea who to contact at the agency. So make sure it's either you have a, a, a email address or a name or a contact number so that the public can actually reach the people in your office who are responsible for putting this information on, on the website. Um, some resources for agencies, number one, ISDC, we're the community that does this work, so we should be able to rely on each other, so make sure if you're not active or participating that you do participate. Um, the FAR, the rules actually are resources for us that we need to follow. Agency decisions um, are important to look at sometimes, also just for consistency's sake. See, what, what did I decide in this case? Or call up another agency. You have a case, have you ever done this? Or do you have this similar fact pattern? How did you treat it? That sort of thing. Training programs, there are a bunch out there. IG has training programs, FLETC, the FAI, DAU, 
Um, I don't know what mats, what training is on mats. Is, training, is it our training materials that we're, okay. So we have a whole bunch of training materials that are actually on the uh, OMB Max website. And I think if you're part of the ISDC, somebody in your shop has a password to be able to get onto there. But we have a lot of templates, a lot of documents. In addition to the ones that you have here in the booklet, we have a lot out there for you um, to scroll through. Um, okay, the SIGI, and I think their training is coming up in November, but that's always a good one to attend for training. Um, the SOPs that we mentioned are resources for you. Again, anybody who wants to see a copy, it's not, I don't think it's in the materials here, but I think if you go on OMB Max, you can find uh, copies of SOPs. If not, you can email or call my office and we can send you um, GSA's um, SOP for S&D. There's also all these subject matter experts that are in each agency, as I said before, don't be afraid to pick up the phone or send an email, call and talk to somebody if you need some information. Again, same thing, consult with other federal agencies, do that all the time. And of course, the agencies, SDO and program offices. I think that's it, any questions? No? Well, thank you. Well, we no, no questions, but just a couple of things to emphasize from Maria's presentation. First of all, uh, suspension and debarment is not about the numbers. A lot of our stakeholders uh, try to make this thing to be about numbers. It is not about numbers. It is about making smart business decisions to protect the government's interest. You should never feel that uh, you're that that you need to hit a particular number to uh, to make for a successful program. Uh, on metrics, um, there's just a couple of areas that I would throw out for your consideration that I really encourage you to track. Again, this goes back to these notions of transparency, consistency, and fairness in our in our systems, and that is measuring from intake to referrals. We, we, in, we stated a couple times, referral means something. That's at a point at which the action is ready for active consideration uh, to make a decision. So uh, to make sure that things don't languish in your intake pipe, use that as a metric, moving from intake to referral. From referral to your decision to initiate a suspension or a proposed debarment. Um, making sure that once the, the matter lands uh, and is determined ripe for consideration that it doesn't languish on somebody's desk. Um, measuring from the point at which the respondent or respondents request their record until you produce the record. I can't tell you how many times we've heard in the ISDC about agencies not making that record available immediately upon request. Um, this is something that I'm going to hit on a little bit later, but we owe it to the respondents to make that record available. So measure the point at which that re record is requested and until it's released. And then lastly, measuring from the point at which the record closes until that final decision is issued. Now some of these things, uh, the measurements are actually required by regulation as well, but you should establish a way to determine how your performance uh, is, is going. Uh, and it allows you wonderful snapshots from quarter to quarter, year to year, and opportunities to make continuous improvements. Um, and with that, other questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah, so Could you use a, use a mic, please? Oh, sure. So twice now you've mentioned this idea of, of uh, suspension and debarment as a business decision. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like you to talk a little bit more about that. You know, my minimal involvement with suspension and debarment is that it, you know, comes down to a fundamental question of is the party presently responsible or not? And I have difficulty seeing that as a business decision as opposed to something much closer to a legal decision. So the causes outlined for debarment, you know, those fall more along the, the, the legal lines because it's pretty clear what the causes are. But suspension and debarment, the, the issue of present responsibility, the FAR does give some guidelines as it relates to especially corporations and companies. There are like 10 mitigating factors. But those are not, you know, all inclusive. There, there are other inf there's other information that needs to be taken into account when making a present responsibility determination. And that's, the FAR gives the SDO discretion 
in in that area. And so uh, one of the things you do have to think about is, uh, is this somebody that the business or, or, or a corporation that the business, the government actually wants to do business with? Is it good for the government? Is it good as from a business perspective that the government does business with this? There might be causes, there might be legal causes for taking a suspension and debarment action um, and you still decide not to take a department action because it would not necessarily be in the government's best interest. If there is one contractor that provides the thing that the government needs and the government, you know, would be uh, at risk of achieving its mission because they do not have that thing, then there is the opportunity still not to take action against them. There is a there is a waiver in the FAR that allows for the agencies to still do business with that government that contractor because from a business perspective, we actually do need that uh, that contractor to make our business work. On an individual, it's a little bit more difficult because there are no guidelines in the FAR, but some of those, um, you know, making an individual decision about uh, present responsibility, some of that involves actually meeting the person, looking on the person, talking to the person, seeing from a business perspective, is this a person of integrity, is this a person who's honest, that you actually want to do business. So that's what I mean when I say that this, in the end, the decision to take action is a business one. I'm not saying it's not legal. It needs to be legal also, but it needs to be from the business perspective of the government. What's good for the government's business? Yes, sir. Maria, that's uh, that was a very good question and an attempt at an answer. <laughs> Thanks. The Thanks. problem. Well, please fill it, fill it, fill in the rest, Norm. The, the problem we all have. <laughs> is after a company or an individual engages in misconduct, when can they be trusted again? It's a discretionary decision. It's extraordinarily difficult. And the one flaw in our regulation is who's to say after a period of ineligibility that the company is presently responsible again? And we just don't know. Well, it's I mean, like it's the SDO's rehabilitation role, isn't it? In, in the punitive sense. So we, we don't know. It's discretionary. Um, but it's just a discretion of the SDO in the end, yeah. right? Correct. Okay. I, I'd like to jump into the conversation. It's a business decision because most of these actions, I think, occur under the Federal Acquisition Regulation. Federal Acquisition Regulation is a series of rules relating to how we spend our money in a business context. To outside the procurement rule, we're talking about other, generally other federal financial transactions. Going to Norm's point, can an individual or a company be trusted to receive and appropriately use federal funds, whether in a contract, whether in a grant, whether in any other type of a federal transaction? That's why these things fundamentally come down to business-related decisions. And as Norm points out, it's difficult sometimes to figure out what the right answer is. But that, uh, Maria, I think, indicated at the outset, that's why you've sometimes got to put on the, uh, the tough veneer and, and, and do the best you can and recognize you're going to get beat up probably. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, so let's, let's uh, Maria, thank you very much. Hello.